in previous videos, we've gone through elimination reactions and talked specifically about the E1 reaction. And in this video, we're going to talk about the E2 reaction, which is still an elimination reaction, but it's going to go through a different mechanism. So we'll go through that mechanism and we'll explore a few examples of, of the E2 reaction in, in, in this video. So here we have a, an example of an E2 reaction, or, or at least I should say an elimination which goes through the E2. So we're starting with an alkyl halide here, and we're treating it with sodium methoxide. This is our base. And notice that the products here, we're forming not the alkene between the CH3 and the carbon, but the alkene between there. So it is a Zaitsev product, just like we've seen in E1 reactions. So that's no difference there. And the byproducts of this reaction are sodium bromide, which, and uh, also CH3OH. So OH, o, CH3O minus is going to actually take a proton away from this uh, alkyl halide and it's going to become CH3OH, so the conjugate acid. Now where this mechanistic discrepancy comes in, where it's different from the E1 is when we start to measure the rate of this reaction. And remember in the E1, what was the big step? What was the, the important step in the E1 reaction? Well, the leaving group just leaves, right? The leaving group just leaves and it gives us a carbocation. Well, that's not the case in the E2 reaction. And we'll see why that is in a second here. So if we compare the rate versus the concentration of base. So the concentration of base is down here. And let's say we're going from uh, 1 to 2 to 3 to 4. So we're doubling it, tripling it, quadrupling it. And here's our rate. And as we double it, the rate goes up, we triple it, and quadruple it. The rate is what we say is first order in base. So it's first order in base. Now this is different from the SN from the E1. Sorry, not the SN1. The E1. In the E1 really only the substrate mattered. So let's have a look at what the concentration is versus the substrate. So here's our substrate, Br, and draw in the methyl groups. And we'll do the same exact grades on our, on our graph here, one, two, three, and four. And let's draw in where the dots were gonna be. And this is gonna be our rate here. And, and draw use a different color here and uh, so this should be more linear. Here we go. Maybe, maybe the dots. No, oh, come on. Yeah, it's more like it. Okay, that's good. So you can see the rate increases linearly with uh, the concentration of our substrate. So it's also first order in substrate. In other words, alkyl halide. So first order in base, first order in, in substrate. So therefore it is second overall. The rate law is second order overall. So therefore, what can we say about this, knowing what we do about how the rate of this reaction works? Well, it can't be, it's not the same. It can't be the same mechanism. as the E1. It can't be because the E1 we said is only first order in substrate and this is first order in substrate and in base. So it can't be the same mechanism. All right, let's look at another interesting facet of the E2 reaction. And here's a slightly different E2 reaction that I've drawn up here. Okay, so here we've got this alkyl halide and we're gonna treat it again with a strong base sodium methoxide, and actually I didn't draw the byproducts here, but same byproducts, NABR and CH3OH. And here's what's the really interesting part. So notice here we have CH3, CH2, CH3, CH3Br. When we do this reaction, we note that we only have this alkene. And if you this looks interesting to you, note that, see how these two CH3s are cis to each other? They're cis to each other, or sometimes we would say sin. They're sin to each other. 
That is to say that we do not obtain this product from this E2 reaction, CH3CH2. So this product is not formed. Not formed. So that's interesting. Why could it be that only one product is formed, this cis product, and if we want to use the same terminology here, notice how CH3s are on opposite sides here. This trans is not formed. Interesting. Okay, so using these two pieces of information, we know that we have to involve the base and the substrate in, a, in the rate limiting step. So the reaction is what we call bimolecular and stereochemistry is important. So it's bimolecular uh, rate determining step RDS and also stereochemistry. So here's the mechanism, the hypothesis for how the E2 reaction works. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our base CH3O minus and this base is going to take a proton from this carbon. So it's going to form a bond between oxygen and hydrogen. And at the same time, we're going to break carbon hydrogen and we're also going to break carbon bromine. So in this case, we would be actually doing three arrows all at the same time. And if you had to actually draw out what this transition and draw out this transition state, let's actually do that in a second. So why does this? Why would this make sense? Why is this consistent with with the information we've mentioned so far? Well, first of all, see how both the base and the substrate are involved in this step. So this is bimolecular. And secondly, notice how the hydrogen is up pointing up here and the bromine is pointing down. This would provide this product exclusively because see how the CH3 is kind of pointing out at us and this CH3 is also pointing out at us. And when we form the product here, the CH3s are both pointing out, CH3, CH2 is pointing kind of back and the H is pointing back. This also explains the stereochemistry. So this explains the bimolecular rate determining step and the stereochemistry. Now maybe we should draw out in a little bit more detail exactly how this is occurring because it might not be immediately clear. So I'm going to draw out what we call the transition state for this reaction. So in the transition state, what we're going to do is we're going to have we're going to have a partial we have partial bonds in our transition state. We're gonna have a partial bond between oxygen and hydrogen, and we're gonna be breaking the carbon to hydrogen bond. And at the same time, we're gonna have our CH3 here, and we could have our um, CH2, CH3 here. And we're also gonna be breaking our carbon bromine bond, and we're gonna have, this is gonna be Pretty close to planar by now, CH3 and H. Okay, and these are actually full bonds. We're not breaking these. These, this, this, these are wedges. But this is a partial bond. So maybe we can draw it in, in pink. Pink for partial. Okay. Now remember what the orbitals look like for this bond. We have an orbital here between the carbon and the hydrogen. And we also have an orbital here between the carbon and the bromine. And it's these orbitals, okay, which are going to start overlapping with each other. This is what's gonna form our pi bond. Okay, this is gonna form our pi bond. And, and if you remember what a pi bond looks like, in the final product, we're gonna have CH3, H, and another CH3 and um, CH3, CH2. It's going to look like like this, right? So we're going to have a pi bond in our final product. So 
it turns out that this information, this mechanism fits the data we have seen very well. We have to have this orientation between hydrogen and bromine and what we call, we call this orientation anti, anti. So an anti orientation between the hydrogen and the bromine. The bromine is pointing straight down. So it's like at 6 p.m. if you think of a clock. And so that's the bromine. And the hydrogen is pointing straight up. So it's kind of like at 12 p.m., the hydrogen. And for the E2 reaction to occur, in order for it to occur, there must, must be uh, anti-relationship between hydrogen and the bromine, and which is our leaving group. Okay. Now, if we were trying to draw out the transition state for, let's say, why wouldn't we be able to do this reaction if we flipped it the other way around? So maybe this is this is worth doing for this other product. So let's let's try and explore why we didn't form that other product. Well, we would have to flip that bond around. So let's let's keep everything here the same, CH3. And let's have CH2 and CH3. And now let's let's have the bromine Paint pointing up. Now you have to do a little bit of trickery here, but if you know how to rotate bonds 180 degrees, then this would put your uh, actually, if I knew how to rotate bonds 180 degrees, more like. Um, so your CH3 would be in the back, and the hydrogen would be in the front. Okay, and then what would happen here is you'd have to have CH3 O minus. And it would have to be taking a, uh, a proton away from here. If we try to do this, this, this does not work. Why does it not work? Well, because as it turns out, in order to break this carbon bromine bond, you have to there's an anti-bonding orbital here. You might remember this from discussing the SN2. There's an anti-bonding orbital behind the, the carbon bromine bond. And you have to put electrons in to this anti-bonding orbital in order to break the carbon bromine bond. So this, when we have this, this would be the, actually let's use a different color here. So in this so-called where we'd have the hydrogen and the bromine on the same side, this would be syn, okay? This, this does not work because we can't donate this pair of electrons from the carbon-hydrogen bond, which is gonna become our pi bond. There's no anti-binding orbital for it to donate in. It can't break because it can't break the carbon-bromine bond. Okay, so therefore, this does not work, and we do not form uh, the product that we drew earlier. So, H, CH3, CH3, and uh, ethyl. So, this does not occur. So, that's an overview of the E2 reaction. And we'll see stereochemistry is a really big deal. We're going to go into more detail on the stereochemistry of the E2 reaction in subsequent videos.